Christian Women's Alliance International presents women from around the world telling their life-changing story from sickness to health, from layman to minister, restoration of marriage, from poverty to prosperity. On today's program, hear the secret of their success. Now, here's our founder, Carol Scarf. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Carol Scarth, and we want to thank you for joining our program today. We have as our guest speaker, Pastor Phil Frederick, who is our spiritual cover for Christian Women's Alliance. And Phil, I respect you so much because of your awesome gift of prayer and knowing the word and so we're just going to get right into our message and I know I've had a little bit of a background on what you're going to be talking about which is based on Psalms 8 verse 4 what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him tell me how God is mindful of man and how he visits man well God is love and love has to have something to lavish itself upon. I'm firmly convinced that's why God created men. We are objects of his love. And he is, uh, for from the time of creation, he has sought to establish a relationship with us. And uh, if I can, I'd like to, to read that scripture again to just kind of give us uh, insight on how much that we mean to God. And in, in Psalms uh, verse 8, uh, starting with verse 4, it says, What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hand, and you have put all things under his feet. And as we go back and look at that uh, scripture where it says, What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him? God is eternally trying to visit us. Uh, we see in the scripture in Genesis 3, 8, uh, as an example it says, and talking about Adam and Eve, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then in verse 9 it says, And then the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? We see from this scripture that God literally came down to the garden to visit them and to commune with them in the cool of the evening. And unfortunately, we also see there as, as man's uh, desire to hide from God and not want to be in his presence. But God is so desirous to visit us. Over in, uh, in uh, Revelation 3, it talks about where the Lord Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you will open the door, I will come in and dine with you. Right. And that is to commune with us, to have close, intimate relationship and fellowship with us. Right. So we see that that is God's desire. And then as we go on looking at this scripture, it says, And you have made him a little lower than the angels. That word angel there in the Hebrew is Elohim, which is the name of God. So he has made man a little lower than, than himself, than God. Yes. Another thing we might stop and think about is when we're born again and become members in the body of Christ, that it says literally in the spirit realm, we're seated with him in heavenly places. That's right. And so it's mm -hmm. just everything he does is to, to establish that relationship and fellowship with us. And it goes on in that same scripture there, and you have crowned him with glory and with honor. He has empowered us. He's given us this earth suit so we can survive here on this earth. But he's also deposited his spirit within us so we can commune with him in heaven. That's right. And so he has just always continually extended his hand of love and mercy and compassion trying to encourage us to come closer to him. Right. It's almost impossible to think about an almighty God who is so powerful wanting a friendship 
with man. Amen. And yet he did, as you mentioned, come down to fellowship with Adam and Eve. Uh, we've talked a little bit about deliverance. Can you tell me the purpose of deliverance? The purpose of deliverance is to set us free. And uh, after we're born again in Colossians 1.13, Scripture says that he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And so that is the whole thing. And, and the born again experience is the, the, a miraculous thing where we are literally transformed. There is two kingdoms. There's a kingdom of God, and there is a kingdom of this world, and Satan is a little G-O-D, God of this world, and so God's desire is to get us out of the kingdom of this world and walk in the fullness of his kingdom. That's right. Um, how does... Um, what is the purpose? Well, we've talked about the purpose of, of uh, deliverance. I want to ask you a question on how does man acquire the need for deliverance? The scripture says no man comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. And so he is continually drawing people. Uh, and I'm going to share a little of my testimony. I was born again when I was 46 years old. And I lived a very, very sinful life. And then all of a sudden, I started feeling convicted in my heart about things that I'd done for years. And I literally thought, well, this is stupid. Why should I feel this way? I've, I've done this forever, you know. But it was because I had a sister-in-law who had a whole church praying for me. Right. And there's a scripture that says, where two or more come together, yeah. agreeing here on earth, as touching what we ask, it shall be done for us by our Father which is in heaven. <laughs> so as they were interceding for me, and all through the time of history as people are being born again, there are intercessors who are asking God to draw them unto him, which he is more than willing to do. And so it's very important uh, for us to stand back a little bit and talk about this born again experience. Now earlier I talked about there's two kingdoms, a kingdom of the world or the yes. kingdom of darkness yes. and the kingdom of light. In John 3:16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The kingdom of this world is death. The kingdom of God is everlasting, eternal life. That's right. Who would turn that down? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and the wonderful thing is that God so loved the world. It wasn't he loved the religious bunch or he was a respecter of persons because scripture says he is no respecter of persons and so it doesn't matter what state we're in it doesn't matter about the sin in our life God will meet us at our point of need whenever we relinquish we just give up and let go and say okay God I want you to be Lord of my life and so anyway in that scripture also he sin is only to re begotten son deem us to purchase us I see that like if we would pawn something in a pawn shop and to get that out then we have to go pay a price to redeem that item that we put in the pawn shop well he sent his very best now all of the gold and the silver belongs to him the word says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof but yet he didn't send gold or he didn't send silver. He sent his very best, which was his son, yes. who is a creator of this universe. And so he sent his very best to come to redeem us. And going on in verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that... Uh, the world through him might be saved. So in answer to your question about deliverance, 
deliverance is all about saving us. That's what it's totally about. It's all about setting us free. That word there, save, is uh, sozo, S-O-Z-O, and it means to save, it means to deliver, it means to heal, it means to preserve, it means to do well, it means to be whole. So the entirety of the package of salvation, that is the essence of deliverance in itself. We can minister deliverance through the power of God, but there's only one person that can deliver anyone, and that's God. Right. And so, but that's in essence what he chose to do when he started out on this whole whole situation. Tell me, uh, I have had people say to me, oh, you don't know what I've done. There is no way that God would forgive me. How would you address that? He forgave me. <laughs> that's <laughs> been there done that I know that he is he just totally and unconditionally saves us uh, and again down in verse 18 there it says he who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe in him is condemned already because he who uh, has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God so there is nothing that God won't forget. The One of the disciples came to Jesus and said, and I think it was Peter if I remember correctly, but he said, how many times should we forgive? Seven times. And Jesus says, no. Seventy. Yes. Think about that. It's 490 times. His, his uh, blessings are fresh, renewed every morning. And so looking at that from that connotation, he says, forgive them 490 times in the course of the day. And believe you me, he doesn't, he doesn't limit that. But his forgiveness goes on and on. Now we have to, we have to uh, respond to him and repent. And that's what salvation is all about. First off is repentance. That we have a heartfelt sorrow for the way we've conducted our life and we ask him to forgive us of those sins and the scripture says if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that's in John 1 uh, uh, 1 John 1 9 and there's nothing that we can do that he will not forgive us of because it says there that he forgives us of all unrighteousness. I'm also reminded of the scripture uh, that says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white, white as, as snow. snow. And how does that happen, that they are white as snow? He, he uh, chooses to re remember our sins no more. There are two scriptures that also go along with First John 1, 9. One of them is that he chooses to remember our sins no more. If I committed a sin, and if he walked in the door that very minute, and if I had asked him to forgive me of my sins, and I'd say, oh, Jesus, forgive me of whatever it was I just did. And he says, what are you talking about? I don't remember. You know, so he chooses and then there's another scripture that says, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. And in Jeremiah 31, 34 says, and I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Right. So when we go through this born again experience, and, and I'll equate it to like if this, this place was full of file cabinets, and all of the sins of that 46 years was charged against me. And when I'm born again, you could go open every one of those file cabinets and they will all be gone. Totally be gone. Totally forgiven. Amen. Totally redeemed. And so then what happens, the enemy comes back so many times and tries to condemn people of what they've done in their past when it's not God, it's the devil. And so they just don't need to listen to the lies that the devil tries to put on them. Yes, and they do refer him as the accuser. That's it. He's the accuser of the brethren. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, then also in John 3, 3 through 7, this is so, so crucial. 
because of what we've talked about of this born again experience Jesus was speaking uh, and he was talking to Nicodemus who was a Pharisee one of the leaders one of the elite leaders of the religious uh, group of that time and Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him most assuredly I say to you unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of God so if we don't yield ourselves and and receive that born again experience yes. there's no hope for us to see uh, the kingdom of God in verse 4 Nicodemus said to him how can it be that a man born when he is old can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born and Jesus' answer was most assuredly I say to you unless one is born of water well, that's of the natural birth and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God yeah. so when we exist on earth we've already been born of water but we have to be born of the spirit to enter the kingdom of God verse 6 goes on to say that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit so there's an actual birth going on there and it says do not marvel that I say to you you must be born again amen and in 1st John 3 8 it says for this purpose that the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil and so that's a whole reason that Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil in our lives that's right and uh, praise God and Satan is the one who comes to kill steal and destroy mm -hmm. but God comes to give us life and that life more abundantly through his son Jesus Absolutely. Christ Hallelujah. Hallelujah. all right um, let's go on and talk a little bit about how special we are to God okay we are very very special there's uh, several scriptures uh, one says that before the foundation of the world began I knew you there's another one where he spoke to Jeremiah he said before you were formed in your mother's womb I knew you I ordained you to be a prophet so God has an awesome plan for our life Another thing that if we can tell on how uh, special we are in Psalms 139, 13, it says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me. So God is an omnipotent, all-knowing God. He knows the beginning from the end, and his scripture here talks about that, and he's planned our life out for us. Uh, then in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, there's a profound statement it goes on to say or do you not know that your temple is of the Holy Spirit who is in you whom you have from God that you are not your own uh, for you were bought at a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's yeah. So we have been purchased with a very, very, very special price, which was the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That blood had could not be the blood like we have because the sin nature was passed down. Uh, when children are born, when children are born, they uh, the the blood of the Father goes through them. But Jesus, Father was the Holy Spirit the word talks about that Mary was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit so he did not have that sin nature in his blood and that's what made that blood so special so precious so God sent his very best to us yes he did. his very best and uh, he is continually like we are talking about reaching out to us all the time yes given us the very best that he yes, has. Yes, God is good and mm -hmm. it is amazing to me that even from the very foundations or before the foundation of the earth 
he knew us and he desired to have fellowship with us and I just find that such an awesome concept <laughs> that he really wanted to have fellowship with me and with you and God is wonderful amen yes amen. He, he is wonderful amen all right well, even there's more special things beyond that even. In uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, it says, For do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you're not your own? In Israel, back in the days before Jesus came, to be able to worship God, they would have to travel from many, many miles yes. to the temple. That's right. But now God and His love and mercy and compassion has made it so easy for us because we can worship Him anytime, any place. We can pray anytime, any place. We can commune with Him anytime, any place. So He is consistently trying to make it easier and easier and easier for us. Yes. He is. He is a wonderful God, and He has a wonderful plan for mankind. <laughs> Would you like to explain that? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, first off, before I explain this, I want to. Uh, there's a scripture that says, "God speaking that my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, that my ways are higher than your ways." So, in the natural, it is very hard to understand what the Word of God says. It has to be, a revelation has to come by the Spirit. But that can only come as we read the Word. But in Daniel 7, 27, and this is talking about in the future time, during that millennial reign, a thousand years, when yeah. Christ returns to earth. But the Scripture says, a prophetic Scripture, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High God. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So God has prophesied that he is going to give to his saints, which is all born-again believers, he is going to give to us a kingdom and in Revelation 5, 9, and 10, it explains it a little bit more. And it says, they sang, uh, and they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you, and this is talking to Jesus, For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign here on earth. So what he's talking about there, when Jesus comes back down to earth, the earth is going to be in such a chaotic state. Scripture says that had he not came down, man would destroy himself. Right. And so when Jesus returns, this earth is going to uh, just be exceedingly chaotic. And... He is going to rule and reign and set up a government and rule with a, a rod of iron. And we shall be priests and kings of our God. In other words, the uh, saints are going to be the rulers and going to be the priests of that thousand-year millennial reign. And at that time, of course, we'll have our glorified bodies. So we don't even know the extent of the plans of God, how far it right. goes. Right. We just know at the end of the thousand year reign that the new Jerusalem is going to come down and it talks, or it's just some tremendous things that's going to happen even at that time. So, But God has every bit of it planned out in detail for us. Right. And you know, so many times people will think that they are left out, that uh, this couldn't include them. And yet it says... Um, Every tribe, every tongue, every, all people and nations. So that includes everybody, Amen. doesn't it? Amen. Amen. Um, I want to share a scripture now because I know that there are some people who probably have never received Jesus into their hearts. And we would like to, uh, at this point, offer them an opportunity to do that. In Romans 10, 9 and 10. 
It says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that uh, and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, uh, Pastor, would you like to address this? Okay. Well, if anyone hasn't made this decision to be born again, it is a very simple process. Just do exactly what the Word says do. In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. And in Romans 3, uh, 23, it says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, just ask, Father, I ask that you would forgive me of every sin in my life. And in accordance with your word, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe that God has raised him from the dead, and you are saved. It is a very simple thing, and, and uh, it's a matter of believing in the heart. Yes. And you will know, as the scripture says, that the Spirit of God witnesses to your spirit that you are a son of God. Amen. Um, we're going to close our pro program now with a word of prayer. And I do want to thank you for joining us. Please write to us with your prayer requests and uh, with your comments and your um, testimonies. We would love to hear your testimonies. And so, Father God, I thank you right now that many people have opened their hearts to Jesus, the compassionate, loving heart of Jesus, and that they have asked him to come into their hearts. Father, just strengthen them, renew them, and cause them, Father, to walk in the high places that you have designed for them. And Lord, we just give you all praise and honor for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you. And thank you, Pastor Phil, for being here today. Thank we you. always love to have you on our program. Thank you. We know these inspirational stories will serve to increase your faith. So start expecting your miracle today. Write us at Post Office Box 1705, Claremore, Oklahoma, 74018. Or call our toll-free number, 1-888-888. 238-1553 and one of our partners will pray with you. Visit our website often for ministry updates and inspirational programs that will comfort your heart and spirit.